We're going to talk about the virtual thread. That's the new thing coming to JDK 21. It's the final version, no preview. So we'll be able, able to use it immediately when it's available. I guess it's on September, right? Uh, so yeah, who, who, who are excited about that? I'm, <laughs> I'm indeed. I'm, I'm, I'm following this uh, for like long time, all this preview version and everything. So yeah, the only problem is the, probably will not be able to use this in production immediately because your boss or <laughs> your manager will not be happy about migrating in 21 immediately, but you can definitely use your pet project or any other thing, or you can push it really, that it's, it's, it's going to be a nice thing. Uh, all right, so uh, the whole presentation, I have divided this talk into two parts. Uh, one part is basically I'll give you a background so that you can, you know, if you have, uh, what do you say? Basically giving you an idea what is concurrency, how Java uh, relate with concurrency, so all those things. It will be short, so I will not bore you a lot. But if you have questions regarding those things, you can ask anytime. Um, I'll, we'll discuss. All right. So first thing is, uh, probably we all know this, right? From the day zero Java introduced thread. I mean, that's the one of the reasons why Java is popular today. Who would disagree with me? <laughs> Yeah. yeah, so when Java introduced first in 1995, by the way, do you remember last 23rd May was Java's 28th birthday? Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's been 28 years, uh, and, and from the day zero Java introduced it, and no other programming language back then was not able to do all this uh, fancy stuff with code currency, right? So that was amazing. So what a thread essentially means is a, an execution environment. Uh, so essentially what it means that if we had two execution environment, I can two, run two block of code simultaneously. If we have 10, then I have 10 execution environment in my operating system, in my computer, or in my application, whatever you can say. <laughs> so that's amazing, basically. So that means uh, you know, if we have more execution environment, my applications will be more interesting. We can do a lot of interesting things simultaneously. So. That's, that's essentially made Java popular. Because otherwise, you know, if we have one process and I can run one thing at a time, it's boring, right? I have to finish that task and then wait for, wait for a while. Think about a calculator. You press a button and wait. <laughs> so especially the UI, uh, in the UI space, uh, uh, it made more interesting because you can you know, simultaneously do a lot of things. You can click on a button and then background it can do a lot of other things. So the animation was interesting part as well. Anyway, moving on. And if you see in JDK or Java, in all layers, you will see it, it, it's heavily used, this entire idea, which is threads. So in, in all layer, uh, you know, the thread is used. Uh, it could, it's in its exception, thread local, local, debugger, profiler, and if you even not use thread in Java for your day-to-day you know, -day programming you know, task, still you are using uh, thread under the hood. The framework, the, uh, you know, the whole entire ecosystem is built on thread. Uh, so you know, here is a, a simple program over here, which is basically run Hello World in, the, in your console. And if you debug it, you need threads. And if you want to run this from the first curly base to second curly base, it's going to run by a thread, which is essentially a main thread. So from there, we can you know, spawn multiple threads. So that's the idea, basically. All right. Uh, this is the same example I have uh, you know, shared in, in previous slides. Uh, this is how we create threads. Uh, for example, if I start from the first curly base to th third curly base, you know, last curly base, it's a scope, right? This scope is going to execute it by main thread, but inside we can create more scope, more execution environment with creating new threads. And we create new threads like this. Even though you know, in some advanced uh, uh, you know, framework, sorry, advanced framework like executors and some other uh, you know, framework, they use fancier method, but under the hood, this is what it is basically. You create instance of thread, and then you, know, you put your stuff inside this 
curly brace. Whatever you put inside this curly brace, it is going to be executed by a different execution environment. All right. So keep that mind, basically. All right. So um, what I'm trying to say over here is, you know, if you, uh, let's say I have created a thread, whose name is thread over here. It's a, I should have chose a different name, but uh, think about it, it's a, it's a thread, new thread, and I have added a line over here, system out print ln, and then I slept for a while. And if you take the thread dump, you'll see something like that, uh, which is uh, basically, it will, it will um, uh, don't worry about all these things, but just, um, you know, uh, uh, there's a line over here called ID, Something like binary, uh, not binary, it's hexadecimal, I think. So this is, a, this is the kind of mapping with operating system thread. What essentially tells me that the Java thread that we are using is not actually construct, uh, Java construct. Rather than Java thread is basically uh, a one-one mapping with operating system thread. So what I'm trying to say is, even though we are using Java thread, ideally internally, we are, using, we are relying on operating system. So in code, when we create a new instance of Java, basically we request operating system, give me a, uh, your native thread, and I'll work on, on top of that. So, so we have to keep that in mind. Java thread isn't a Java construct. It's pretty much operating systems uh, thing. So yeah, so the, this whole slide basically explains that. Anyway, so now what's the problem we have? Uh, so the first problem is, um, is threads are expensive. Um, what do you mean by expensive? When we have a thing that we want, but it is scared, we cannot have as many as we want, that means it be, the price become high. So that's the uh, 101 of, uh, what do we call? Um, economy or economics or something like that. I, <laughs> I'm not a student of economics, obviously, but from the definition, we can say that uh, you know, threads are expensive because we cannot create as many as we want. How? I'm going to demo that. <laughs> anyway, so there are few things to consider. First of all, you know, um, uh, when we want to create threads, uh, we don't want to create on an ad hoc basis. The, the, the idea is whenever we need a thread, if we want to create a new thread, it's going to cost us. Uh, cost us in a way that, uh, for example, thread.start called considered inefficient because it's called native things and then rely on uh, in operating systems. So it, there is a delay. Then it takes like two bytes, uh, two megabytes of memory outside of the heap. So that's uh, another concern. And um, in a context switching, that means if we have more threads, the, the uh, uh, operating system, I mean the um, core of the CPU has to you know, manage all those things, switch uh, between multiple um, you know, threads. That's a, that has a cost. So if we take all this information and if we want to sort of create a million threads, that will take around one terabyte of memory, which is a lot, especially in this cloud era, right? We want to <laughs> use our resource a very, uh, what do we say? You know, economically, we want to use as little and then spend money on as much as less as we can, but then we take on, we want to take all these benefits. So, so that's 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 our problem basically. So I have a demo for that uh, to you know sort of um, uh, demonstrate that. I'll go into that. So think about our uh, you know modern uh, application architecture or application the way we write applications. For example, if you think about Spring Boot applications, what it, what we do is uh, we send a request to the server. What server does is, it takes the request and hand over this request to a thread, basically. And that particular thread, you know, pull the database and, uh, you know, do some processing and then send it back. So the HTTP, you know, we all know the HTTP is the stateless protocol, right? It just, you know, send a request and then it will send you back some response and then forget. So this whole journey, usually in traditional servlet spec specification, if you see, it's done by a one, one thread. So basically, what it means is, uh, if I have uh, 400 thread on my operating, on my, let's say this particular machine can handle only 400 thread, and I 
instantiate all this 400 thread. That means at a point of time, I can only send 400 requests. Uh, but you know, with this era, we, for example, the social media and other applications, we have like millions of users. Uh, it's difficult to scale at this point. So what we do is we get multiple instances of uh, you know, same thing, same applications, so that we can handle. But at, at most of the cases, you will see our threads are basically staying idle. How? Let me give you an example. Let's say uh, I send a request. The server, you know, pull the thread and you know, hand over this request to that server. Now, sorry, that thread. So now my, I'm probably pulling some information from the database, pulling some information from some other third-party services, and I'm waiting while I'm getting those results. So my thread is essentially waiting to get some result from other services. While it is waiting, it's not doing anything. It's just staying idle. So in on average cases, it, most of the time, threads are you know, staying idle like this in our modern application system. So first of all, one thing is it's scarce because we cannot create as many as we want. And then we are keeping it idle, not utilizing it. That means we are wasting money, right? Uh, but if you see modern operating system, they can handle something like concurrent, millions of concurrent requests. So operating system doesn't have problem. Only problem is the limitation is how many thread we can create. So theoretically, if we could create millions thread, that means we could handle millions request. But again, we are limited by the number of thread we can create. So that's the problem. So that means if we could uh, you know, virtually or theoretically create millions of thread, that means we could save a lot of money. Because our threads are basically you know, staying idle and they're not doing anything. So these are the problems, basically. <laughs> so uh, essentially, what are, we are trying to do is, after you know, uh, introducing the problem, we're going to try to solve that problem, right? Yeah. So that, that's what I'm coming to uh, you, you know, my uh, forthcoming slides, but but you understood the problem, right? Any any question? All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a quick demo. So bear with me. If I can sit over here. Ah. Yes. All right. So can you see the code, or should I zoom further? That's good. OK. So this computer is, uh, let me show you the you know, capacity of this computer. It's like a 2.3 gigahertz computer with 16 GB memory. And yeah, so what I'm trying to do here is I would let the, this program to create as many threads as it wants. In a while loop, it will keep on creating new threads. And the idea is fans, uh, you know, will wait until this application crashes because, uh, you know, so that's the highlight. So let's do that. So it's creating, um, you know, number of threads. And after a while, you see, after 4,000, it crashes. And it says, unable to create native threads, possibly out of memory. So that's, so basically, what it demonstrates is the limitation. We can, with these resources, we can create only 4,000 threads. Um, so that's a, that's a problem, essentially, right? We want to you know, uh, uh, get, uh, we want to increase our throughput with, by million, but we are <laughs> limited by the number of threads. And that's basically it. So, yeah. Uh, so you show the specs of the computer, but it's probably maybe more related to the JVM. Like, if you, you see what I mean. Like you yeah, so I understood your question. Yeah, understood your question. Basically, um, so let me give you a calculation. Even though I have 16 GB of memory, I mean, it's this computer using other things as well, right? Uh, but uh, let's say each thread takes two megabytes of memory outside the, of the heap. And JVM takes the amount of heap from the memories, from the 16 GB, right? 
and let's say I give like four, four GB of memory to HIP, and I have still like uh, 12 gigabyte of memory available, and I keep on creating threads, each of this thread is taking two megabyte of memory, and then after a while, I'm gonna run out of memory. So that's what I'm trying to demonstrate over here. Even though if, if we have increased memory, uh, we can have like a... Uh, you cannot increase beyond the... the right, right. Uh, but yeah, but if I, you know, for example, in a, in a uh, cloud environment, if I, you know, borrow like um, 100 GB of memory, I could essentially increase number of threads, but then I will have some other problems as, as we do, which is context switch and, you know, all those parts, because uh, at CPU count would be, uh, again, limited, right? So, yeah, so essentially there are multiple problems. One of the problem is number of thread we can create. But then, like, uh, like, 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 so, so, okay, so let me cover, uh, you know, follow that question with thread pool. What essentially thread pool does is solve one problem. Uh, first problem, that do you remember I said that the thread.start is inefficient, ad hoc basis? So let's say over here in this example, uh, what I did is I keep on creating threads, right? And, and whenever I need, a, uh, need something, we do execute separately, I, I'm creating a new thread. So think about an application, web application. Whenever a request come, I'll create a new thread. So that means I'm gonna receive a lot of requests. Every time I'm gonna create new threads, what essentially would do is if I get a brass request for, 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 for a moment of time, uh, it will consume all this thread and then application will crash. So that we want to prevent that. So that's why we, what we do is we create a pool of thread initially when a startup, let's say I'm gonna create thousands. Yeah. Each time I'm gonna get a request, I am pull, I'm gonna pull a thread from the pool so that I don't have to create again. They will decide uh, in the pool all the time running. So I have got a received request, I'll just pull one from th that pool. And let's say I have received uh, 1,000 requests, and next request, that request has to wait because there is no thread available at this moment in the pool. So, so that prevents crashing the application. <coughs> but so far, it's still the native threads that are in, that are handled by the pool, right? Because under the hood, it's still native. Yeah, I mean, all threads are native. Yeah. All threads are uh, given by operating system. Java doesn't create threads. It's just a thin the layer. Yeah. Um, all right. So we have got the problem. Anyway, moving on. So this is the demo I wanted to show. <laughs> All right. OK. So the part two is basically the solution. Before going to the solution, I want to show you another demo. So let me go into the demo. Hmm. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, I'm going to explain this in a minute. Just okay. So can you can you see the code, right? You can you can. So what it is essentially a, a mimic uh, a, a simulation of the web application that we use nowadays. Um, in Java especially, right? So basically our server is waits on a port and we send request. And then the request is handled by a, a handler. Over here, our handler is just a method. It doesn't do anything. It, it receives the request and whatever text we send, it just transform it uh, to upper cases. So uh, that's the simple, simplest <laughs> demo I could find uh, to show you. So. So what essentially it did is it created a server and it's waiting to uh, get request. So what I'm gonna do over here, um, okay, let me choose this one because the font would be a problem. Mm, this is also a problem, right? Can you see the text? I don't think you can read that. Let me see if I can increase the font. 
preference somewhere over here. I'm not sure where. Settings, okay. Appearance, okay. So over here, if I make it 16 or 18, do you think? Line height. Can you see now? Should I increase a little bit more? Let me try a little bit more. Sorry, I ha should have come prepared, <laughs> but anyway. So that's, I made it 20, okay. So what I did is I connected the server with the telnet and if I write over here something, you can see it's sent back with the uppercase letter. So what I'm gonna do now is, you know, I'll, I'll telnet again in, from another client. So if I type over here, I don't get anything because it's a single threaded server. It just, it, it can handle one thing, one at, thing at a time. So if I kill that, you see, I have received responses. So I can quickly turn into a multi-threaded environment. How? Um, that's simple. What I'm gonna do is, you know, I'll just create a new thread. Party, new thread. Pass it over here. And t dot start. So if I run this application now, this is pretty much gonna work out of the box. Um, so I'm typing over here, I'm getting response. And if I connect again over here, and if I type, I can get response simultaneously. That means two clients. If I, uh, you know, 10 client connect to this server, it will, it will work. What if I send 10,000 requests now? Okay, so, <laughs> so I have a uh, you know DDoS simulation over here. <laughs> so I'm gonna send 10,000 requests. Let's see what happens. Uh, so it basically does nothing. It just sends requests to that particular server and try to connect that, and it's sending. So after a while, you can see server. It says unable to. Basically, application cast. So this one is prevented by the thread pool. If I had a thread pool over here, my application won't, won't crash. But you know, let's say if I if I had a thread pool with thousand threads, uh, after thousand requests, uh, the, uh, the the application server would stop responding to any others. So that's also a problem, right? We want to uh, create our application uh, in responsive way. If it doesn't respond, that's a problem as well. So these are the basically problems we have. And we have uh, in a, uh, come up with a multitude of solutions to tackle those things. One of is reactive programming, which is essentially, uh, uh, you know, the, all these I.O. methods are written differently. And, uh, you know, it tries to bypass this waiting period. Uh, and it has some other side effect of reactive programming. For example, the way we write reactive programming is completely different than traditional programming. So you have to learn that thing first, and then all of your code has to be non-blocking. If you write one bit of blocking code inside this uh, uh, non-blocking code, then it will, uh, you know, impact your application performance. So, so that's one problem. The other problem is the traditional way of debugging. You know, we see. Uh, you know, for this this particular case, we can easily debug. We can, you know, put a pointer right in it. But for reactive programming, you never know which thread is running this code of code. Uh, the way you are seeing in your code, code, uh, you know, and the execution path is completely different. So when something goes wrong in the reactive environment, uh, it's difficult to debug. Uh, and for secondly, it's extremely difficult to conceptually, you know, prepare on your head. Uh, from this method, it will execute this, it will execute this. You never know which thread is gonna execute this portion of code. <laughs> so those are the problem, basically. Uh, all right. So what I'm gonna do is, um, essentially, stop this. Now, okay, I've stopped that. Server. 
Mm, where is my single thread server? Okay, so now I'll, I'll change this code a little bit and, and let's see what's the output. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a try catch block where executors, uh, executors. So usually we create thread pool like that, right? Uh, you know, we create a cast, uh, a fixed thread pool. Let's say we, we can create a fixed thread pools like thousands and then it will create thousand uh, requests, uh, threads and it will keep running. Whenever I get a request, it will just pick from that pool. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm not gonna do that. Let, okay, so let me keep that this way. Uh, now executors will submit um, something like that. Handle socket. So usually in our traditional uh, you know, pro production system, we, we're gonna write code something like that. So we'll have a thread pool. Maybe we'll create executors in some different places. For example, Spring has a different way of uh, creating executors with the you know, argument, you know, taking parameters from the application config, all those things. But essentially it creates, uh, it uses uh, executors under the hood. So it's a simpl simplified version, basically. Wouldn't, wouldn't you create that outside of the while loop? Uh, yeah, I would probably create outside of the loop, sorry. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Otherwise, it will it will keep creating executors over and over. It will create thousands of pools. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So yeah. So that's probably the uh, uh, you know production code that we we use nowadays. So I can just change one line over here, and I can just use this line, which is new virtual thread exe uh, tax executor. That's all the change I needed for our current code base. And if I run this server, let's run this server, and then I'm gonna you know, send this uh, <laughs> DDoS attack simulator again. And let's see what happens. It doesn't impact anything on, you know, it just runs. <laughs> and it keeps running. And if I send again, it will probably keep uh, running. So, so that's the uh, solution, basically. One line change in, in a, from, from your current production code. If you are using a, one minute, if you are using uh, um, you know, a traditional uh, connection, uh, sorry, thread pool, you can just change it to um, this, this, and it will work out of the box. I'm gonna explain how it works, what's the magic behind it, but <laughs> before explaining magic, why not I show you the magic? <laughs> <laughs> um, can I, can I ask you? Um, if you replace uh, the submit with completable future and leave your thread pool, will you uh, the thing without? Mm, sorry, just uh, let me open this code again. Um, what did I? So, yeah. If uh, uh, inside the submit you have a completable future, okay. Mm. Then so computable, the, the, the thing is, uh, computable feature is basically the way around of our existing problem. It's, it's also a asynchronous way of doing things, right? Yeah. So uh, it, it has the same problem I was discussing earlier. So, you know, it creates a smaller stage and uh, so that, uh, you know, it creates multiple states basically doing things, as, uh, you know, asynchronously in non-blocking way. That's a way out that we had earlier uh, before coming to this. Uh, but I'll, I'll come to your question in a minute, uh, like in, in the coming slide. Hopefully, you will uh, get a better answer. Uh, I have a question. Can you um, monitor the, the new fixed uh, running in the same handle the request? Like the background, the background. Sorry, can you repeat your question again? I mean, currently, it's um, last time you set up uh, in production right now, normally, we um, a fixed thread pool, right? Mm -hmm. And you put the 1,000, for example, 1,000 uh, thread pool. I would like you to run that code to see if it can handle, like, uh, because uh, before that we don't uh, using a fixed thread pool. So okay. Run, okay. So if I if I run it, sorry. Um, so let, let let me show you the demo. Okay. Let me. See. 
if I run it, and then I send this DDoS attack, right? So, so what it do is it will not crash the server. It will keep on, keep on running until it exhausts thousands uh, thread, and then it will stop. It will not re receive any more requests until someone you know get disconnected from here. So what it happens is, let's say if I have thousand threads fixed thread pool, and I have received thousand requests at that moment, so this thousand request will be served. 1,000 uh, right now, and if I get another request, that request has to wait. It will, the server will not respond to that request because it doesn't have resource to uh, handle. Can I see the log to show that? Uh, because uh, we have uh, 1,000, right? And yeah. If the log, like uh, whenever you handle the request, it will show that uh, it is handling this, right? Um, so, what kind of log you want, we're looking? Over here? Yeah. You can print I in there. Okay. Yeah, I can I can print that. So it's sending request, you know, so basically what it's doing, the simulator is sending request to the server. The server is not responding. So that's what it is. What I can do is I can keep account on Sabrent as well. So, see. Mm, I, I. So over here, uh, you can see over in the handle method, whenever I get a request, uh, I, I'm printing the socket, right? Mm, so inside the for loop, let's say I, I keep a counter over here. And counter zero. Sorry. So what I'm gonna do is, um, you know, each time I'm, I'm receiving a request, um, the, I'm gonna, you know, print this, okay? Sorry about that. Maybe ob not over here, I should, I should ra print this over here because while the keeps on running. Mm, after the after the accept basically. Or maybe inside this would be better, right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> so then I have to change it. <laughs> I have to convert it atomic integer. Atomic integer. Counter. Counter. Increment and get. <laughs> yeah, programming. Yeah, programming by committee. That's what we know. You know what? We invented a new uh, no, programming I, I, paradigm. I, now we can go do the lecture series, right? Yeah. <laughs> all right, my server is yeah. running. So it's sending all this request. Let me go over here. Uh, okay. So uh, I have I have sent like ten thousand right, uh, and in this single th uh, server th over here, I had like one thousand. 
Yeah, I created 1,000, 1,000. Because um, my limit would be 4,000, so I created like 1,000 uh, threads, and I sent like 10,000 requests. I'm trying to send 10,000 requests with the DDoS attack. Over here, you see I am on 10,000 connection. Hey, sorry. Oh, this is 10,000, right? Yeah, the, 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 yeah you, you need to see how long it took to handle to see if there was a difference. Yeah. You can do some sleep in the handle method to make sure that, for example, if the handle is 5 seconds or 10 seconds, so maybe you can see the difference. Okay, so okay, so what I can do is I'll stop this. Um, I have a different demo. Let me let me just wait. Uh, uh, let's just uh, change the change this one, this particular one, and I I I show you something else just in, in a moment. Okay, so. How about I, I, I show you the difference? Like, I can create over here uh, 10, uh, only 4,000 thread. Like, I show you that 4,000 thread. And if I even uh, do this, um, uh, let me, sorry. Just to, just to, give, to give you a demo. Um, um, for executors, new executors. New fixed that pool. So over here, do you think I can create ten thousand? So so ideally theoretically I should not be. The problem is a new text pool do certain intelligent things behind. It doesn't create all these ten thousand at once. Uh, it's a, it's a, it does certain smart things. If you go inside, you'll see fixed that pool doesn't create all these sets on fly. So it do certain intelligence things since uh, you know based on the request kind of request I'm getting. So it so that the for example startup Java startup takes some time you know, and and so so it doesn't want to you know block the uh, increase the startup time for. So what it does it's create few, and it, you know spin the applications and based on request it creates so that it can evenly distribute the amount of creating time to all the all, all the Requester basically, so it does certain uh, things. So probably if I run this, I'm not sure if I if application will crash. No, it didn't crash because it didn't create 10,000 requests set when I started. But um, you know, if I send request, uh, it will probably create. So now uh, let's say we have show, showed the demo, like we cannot create 10,000 on this machine. So what if um, I have a different demo, which is I'm going to create virtual sets. And I'm going to show you that I can create 10 millions of threads. Will that <laughs> make you happy that we can, in fact, create more than what we are capable of with our traditional way of doing things? OK. So here's the, here's the uh, you know, um, applications. Uh, not this one. So this is the, this is the counter, right? So over here. Um, Essentially, uh, th that's the method how we create virtual thread, which is start virtual thread. There are multiple ways of doing things, but just focus on this one. Which one is thread.start virtual thread, it creates a virtual thread. And over here, what I'm doing is, you know, I'm creating thread and then I'm just keeping it idle on the memory. Don't do anything, just stay there. And I'm going to increment the counter. So let's see how, how many we can create over here. Uh, sorry. Is it running this one even? Hmm. What's one running? Uh, my demo broke. It should be, it should be creating Thousands of <laughs> threads. Uh, I think your counter probably needs to start at one for that, if to not hit. Uh, not usually. Not usually. The last time I didn't do that. Yeah, it created. It's like created and then it's died. Okay. 
So maybe what I, uh, the problem is, uh, it's, it's creating the threat. Uh, one thing I, I forgot to tell you, which is virtual threat is by the D1 threat. So basically over here, the main method started over here. And from this main method, I have created a millions of uh, you know, virtual threat probably, and then it died. OK, I have another demo, so don't worry about that. No, it's just, I'm running on 21. We don't need. Line 17, there's a break. After it prints, it ends the. Oh, OK. Yeah. yeah. That's so probably, it, it yeah. Broke it. Bro. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> OK. So now you can see it, it's creating. And it keeps on creating, uh, and 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 it, it will it will keep on creating. And I am I am about uh, over here. I think four four million. Yeah, but still ten. So, so that's the interesting part. Virtual thread doesn't take a lot. It starts with small. And then when it needs, it, it can, you know, it can expand, and then if none, and it can shrink as well dynamically. So it doesn't take a lot of memory. It's like the, it's it's like another object, Java object. Uh, yeah, I'll I'll come to uh, the explanation uh, how it works uh, behind the scene uh, in a minute. But yeah, so what I'm trying to say is, uh, you know, from this whole discussion. Initially, we had a problem with the number because we couldn't uh, create as many as we wanted. Now we can create a lot. So the problem we had earlier, uh, which is um, you know traditional web applications, we have we are um, our throughput is bounded by the number of thread, right? If we had 4,000 thread, we can at at, a, at max at a point of time we can handle 4,000 requests. Now that we have our lim higher limit is extremely large, like a million. Now we can probably you know handle theoretically millions of requests. So our throughput is getting higher. So that's the highlight of whole whole things. Anyway, and so let's say we have a like you know, virtual test created, like it's only using the memory dynamically. It's not using fixed memory, like you said. So let's say it, initially the all the threads were using minimum memory, and then many of the threads started using lots of memory. How will this do the memory management later on? So, so essentially, uh, you know, virtual threads uh, uh, reside on heap, Java heap. So you create a virtual thread. Uh, you can treat virtual thread as a task, basically. You, you submit a task to a virtual thread. It will execute it, and then it will die out regu like regular Java object. Like uh, garbage collector will collect it, and you know, it will, you know, heap will again free. So it's, it's, on the heap. it's on the heap? Yes, it's on the heap. So let me go into that detail in a minute. <laughs> that will be clear some of your questions. So all right. Uh, so that's where my uh, you know part two solution implementation how it does basically this this sort of magic. Anyway, so first of all, let me introduce the virtual thread. How we're going to create? There's two ways. One is you can uh, you know use thread dot start virtual thread, and then you can put uh, stuff into the curly braces, it will going to be executed by a virtual thread. Typical uh, similar uh, code, code syntax, nothing fancy, just different thread. So from a uh, user perspective, the virtual thread and, and traditional thread doesn't have any differences, the way it executes, basically. Internally, the implementation definitely, you know, it's different, uh, but it, it gives us the instance of thread, basically, the traditional classical uh, uh, thread we have. So after introducing the uh, virtual thread, we have now two distinct kind of thread, right? One we call traditional thread, classical thread, and native thread, <laughs> carrier thread. There are lots of names. And the other kind is virtual thread. <laughs> OK. So it, sometimes it's called user thread as well. So, so there's two kinds of thread now. OK. So yeah. Uh, so now I'm going to go into quickly the implementations. Uh, uh, I guess uh, some of the questions will be covered in that uh, in, in that part. Okay, so we have to keep in mind two things. One is uh, fork join pull, and is the another is continuation. 
uh, fork gen pool was introduced like Java 7. It's a way back. It's one of the powerful Ted, uh, you know, a pool. Uh, uh, what do you see, call? Uh, thread pool, basically. Again, we are using the thread pool, but it's a different kind of thread pool, not the traditional uh, others, like fixed thread pool, cast thread pool, all those things. So it has certain distinct property. One is it doesn't create a lot of thread. It creates based on the available CPU you have. For example, you have like eight core, it will probably create eight threads. And it will try to utilize all of them most of the time. So, for, uh, and it, it has a nice way of scheduling things. So if you submit a task, um, you know, it, it will try to distribute the task, all these tasks into eight different codes so that your CPU always utilized. So it's a, it's really, uh, you know, uh, I would say uh, optimized and performance threadful. Based on that, a lot of new feature came. For example, Lambda expression, uh, sorry, stream API, parallel streaming, all those things. Uh, uh, work on top of this fork joint pool. And virtual thread also work on top of this. How? I'm going to you know, explain that. And second thing is continuation, which is a new concept. I'm going to go into that in a minute. All right. So can you see the picture over here? So the whole thing is explained over here. OK. So uh, like I said, operating uh, system has a, a sort of native thread, right? And native thread is uh, scheduled by a OS scheduler. So we have a limited number of that. And OS basically schedule them. And then there is a one-one mapping with, with Java thread. We call it carrier thread, or native thread, or classical thread. You name it, whatever you want to name. There are multiple names for that. So And then on top of this, we have a JDK scheduler. That's a new thing. That's, added, uh, and that's the Java layer. And we are using the fork join pool as a scheduler. Okay. And that is on that scheduler, we are creating a lot of virtual sets, which is totally Java construct. It's, it's like a Java object. We're giving our tasks to that Java object. And these Java object are executed by this all this carrier thread and in, in the, the thread inside the pool. So what happens is when we're creating millions of virtual thread, we are basically creating millions of objects, millions of smaller grand, granular task. And now, let's say I have a fork join pool, and fork join pool has like eight thread. All of them are going to be distributed to those eight thread. Eight thread. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, there's a term for that. It's called mounting and mounting. So what happens is, um, when we created a uh, virtual thread, we basically submit that virtual thread to uh, this fork join pool. It does automatically. We don't do this. We just create a virtual thread. And it automatically submits that virtual thread to a carrier thread. Uh, this is scheduler, basically, for joint pool. For joint pool has his own queue, so they all wait in the queue. And uh, the, this JDK scheduler, which is for joint pool, schedule those things in a FIPO manner, first in, first out. And, and so when, uh, let's say, I have a queue, uh, I pick the first one, and I'm executing on this carrier thread, which is our native thread as a Java object. So while it's executing, um, it sees a I operation. Let's say this virtual thread is um, you know, calling a you know, third party services, a microservices, something else, anything with I operation. What it does is I operation takes some time, right? So it has ability to yield itself from this queue, from this carrier thread. It, ha it has ability to unmount itself. So there is a code written inside this virtual thread. It can detect I operation. If there is I operation, it can you know unmount itself or you know so the, and goes to the you know back of the queue. Now this carrier thread is now free. So it was executing a virtual thread. It sees the I operation. It moves from this execution and it's again free and it can take the next one. So that way. This uh, you know fork join pool is always executing something, so CPU is always utilized. But let's say I'm waiting for an I/O, I'm you know I'm, I'm unmounted from the execution. I'm just waiting, and I can wait as long as I want. I'm not while I'm waiting. I'm not now executing consuming any CPU. On the other hand, traditional thread, when they are waiting, they are actually utilizing it. Uh, so they're staying idle, and they are not able to do anything. 
So, so what happens is with the small amount of uh, you know traditional KDE thread, we can we can serve a lot of virtual thread. So that's the basic insight. So the idea is I can give you a, 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 a you know a real life example. The idea is let's say you go to the bank, and there is a booth uh, you know in the bank, right? Um, so when you send a request to the, the teller, so teller sometimes needs to make certain calls, check emails to give you an output, right? While um, you know he's making calls or you know waiting for uh, em uh, emails, you can stand on this queue and just you know occupy him whole things. He's not doing anything. You are just standing there and occupying him. No one can you know use that time, right? But what if what if the teller says, you know, I take your request, wait the, on the bands, I need to uh, get a response from this other person, maybe email. When uh, there is an email, uh, you will be notified and you will come again. And meanwhile, I can serve another. So that's what happens inside, the, inside this whole thing. So I submit a create a virtual set. It's basically my task. And when there is an I.O. operation, I'll just resume myself. Uh, I'll wait for the you know event operating system event that I was done, and when it's done, I can I can then later uh, you know in the in the in the queue again, and I'll get served again basically. So that's that's the whole thing. So that uh, is uh, holding down to the one state for information. Um, so the whole idea is that you can send down. If I understood correctly your question, that means uh, let's say I have a virtual thread, I have a lot of information inside, like I have, a, I have to maintain a stack. So what what it does is when it's unmount, it copied its stack from the from the existing thread, uh, the native thread it was executing to the heap. This stays on the heap, and when it mounts itself again, it copies the entire stack onto the carrier thread again, and then start working. Uh, so far, uh, the it, uh, what I have seen, it it doesn't take a lot. Basically, there is a, some intelligent mechanism. Um, they have uh, you know they have come up with some intelligent things that I haven't checked yet. But ideally, it doesn't take a lot. It, it's like uh, you can think of it as a traditional you know calling a method, you know executing a Java object. It's something like that. It's whole Java con on construct. I mean, open th one interesting thing is we're doing all these things uh, on top of this JD scheduler. Op operating system doesn't know any of those things. So operating system sees basically a native thread always executing something. So, so basically that's what, and, and maybe there is an overhead. Let's say there is an overhead, you know, copying the heap to memory and then getting the heap into the again. But uh, the win is if we don't do this, the alternative is I'm just idle, you know, wasting a lot of C CPU cycle. So yeah, it's better, right? Much better while I'm utilizing my, uh, you know, native thread all the time. And other uh, the alternative, other alternative is I'm just uh, staying idle. Like in the sense, uh, if one thread, I'm out of power. I just wonder, is this a copy only the, the heap, like the data to the heap, or the, because um, in Java, JVM, if you have a stack and I do, like a, for example, I have a virtual thread. In on methods, uh, on requests, I handle this one. Uh, there's some step I need to do, right? The data I can store in the heap. How about the instruction? Like, uh, the, the so basically, it, very from the very high level, if I execute this portion of code, let's say I have a block of code that I want to write on a native uh, thread, what it does, it's, it's, it's maintain a stack, right? It has a memory and it maintains a stack. Same thing I'm, when I'm doing with virtual thread, I'm still using the stack, right? Now I'm unmounting from there, moving away from. So basically it copies all these things along with and store in the heap. So now my native thread is stack again free uh, and it can take another. 
uh, virtual thread. So initially, the, the virtual thread doesn't have a lot of thing in, on this stack because it's start fresh. Uh, and if it's unmounted, it will have something and it will reside in the heap. And when it will resume, it will take all these things and you know, put into the uh, uh, you know, uh, native state and keep working on it. So, and now question is, the ideal candidate of, candidate of this, what are the kind of tasks we can do with this virtual thread? What if, uh, uh, there is a two kind of uh, tasks we usually do with, with threads. One is computation, one is IO intensive work, which is I, I need to wait on something, right? So this virtual thread is ideal candidate for IO operation, when there is waiting involved, a lot of waiting. But if I need to do a uh, you know, CPU intensive work, uh, like computation, I wouldn't use virtual thread. I would use the traditional thread. Because there's no point of using virtual th thread uh, when I operation. Because I operation doesn't wait or doesn't you know, do anything. It just continue uh, you know, doing computation, right? Uh, so that's why virtual thread is uh, you know, ideally extremely suitable for when we have a network operation, sleeping, file, uh, you know, IO, and, and all those things, basically. And the, the other thing is, uh, we, we have talked a lot of about thread pool, right? Uh, maintaining thread pool. Uh, and it, when we're going to use virtual thread, we're not going to use any, any, any pool. Basically, the use of thread pool is, is gone for the, for the, the you know, IO operation or all those things. So think about it. You have a unit of work which involves IO operation. You treat that a unit of work, and you submit to a virtual thread. It will create a virtual thread. It will execute that unit of work, and that virtual thread is going to die. And if you need another task, you will create a new virtual thread. And if you use the uh, you know the executor dot new the one I showed earlier executor dot new uh, virtual thread parse uh, executor, it automatically does all of those things. So you can just keep submitting your task. Okay, okay, all right. Um, so last thing, I just wanted to uh, give you an idea. Like I said, it mount itself and it out unmount itself, how it does. There is a concept called continuation. I'm gonna go quickly over it because I don't have time. Um, so the basic idea of continuation is it's a uh, bunch of, a piece of code that let's say I have a block of code. I'm executing one line, two line, third line. And then there is I operation. I can suspend myself from that position and when I'm going to resume, I'm going to start from that, that very point, not from the start. So let's say I'm calling a method in traditional sense. Uh, it will always start from the beginning, right? If I call again, same method again, it will call from the beginning, and then it start. So the difference between continuation is it's a construct, it's an abstraction that it can start where it you know, resumed. So I have an a, example over here. See if I can quickly show you since I don't have much time, but I'll, I'll try to you know, show you the demo. So can you see the code? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, just focus on this three line. Um, you know, there is a, uh, some abstraction over here, it's called continuation scope, and then I created a continuation. Inside this three line, um, so that's the uh, code that I'm, I'm, I'm interested. Let's say it could be a method call or a you know, series of instruction. And over here, I have three line of code. First one is C1. I'm gonna print C1. And then uh, there is a method call called continuation.yield. And then I have a C2. So, and over here, I have um, you know, some other methods over here, some other you know, invocation, which is print ln and then run, continuation.run, all those things. So read this code and if I run this code, what would be the output? Can you guess, anyone? Where it will start and where it will end? Start here, C1, coming back, C2, finish? Right. So the <laughs> it's obvious. So the idea is, uh, you know, uh, so if I can run, I'm not sure if I can run because, you know, I, I probably won't be able to run. The reason is, uh, you know, continuation is an internal class of uh, JVM. I am not supposed to touch it. I just copied it for sake of demo, demo, so that I can show you what happens inside. 
So what happens is, uh, you know, uh, uh, let's say this is the code, your, your code. And inside of your code, there is the I operation. Let's say, uh, you know, you did something and then you, you need to wait for a microservice. Uh, and that line is basically this, okay? So what happens is uh, virtual set will internally use continuation scope. It will create a continuation scope and it will start executing your code. And then there is an I operation, let's say file operation or anything. And it will call this continuation.yield. That means this, this virtual thread will uh, you know, uh, yield it itself. And when it will back, it will, it will start from the very point where it, it, uh, it was yielded. So that's the interesting part of continuation. And this is what happens inside the uh, virtual thread. So that's why um, you know, um, it is, if, to accommodate these things in Java uh, 21, and let me go into quickly. <coughs> so, uh, you know, there are a lot of, uh, in the API, there is a massive change inside the API to support that continuation. So that anytime there is a, uh, you know, IO operation happens, it can yield itself from the virtual thread. So the huge, massive change uh, they did to support these things. So um, and that's why it took a, took a while, and virtual sets one concept, and then it needs to accommodate existing API, right? So there, there, there has been massive change uh, on the existing I operation. So benefit is with all these things, for example, uh, we can use our traditional I operation, Java I/O package. We don't probably don't need to use an I/O if we don't want to use because uh, the non-blocking API that Java has, they are nice, they, they are powerful, but uh, writing code with them is really difficult, you know, and make it write also much more difficult. Uh, but while the traditional imperative way of doing things, for example, buffer reader, buffer reader, the old, age-old uh, API, those are easy. It's, it's just imperative, you know what you are doing. And with the, they, they have also, you know, massively, you know, rewritten in, internally so that it can accommodate virtual set. Now, with this, you can again um, uh, something, write something like this. There's a, there's a code over here. Uh, so basically, uh, I, I just wanted to show you difference. It, what it does is, is download a 10K image from the uh, internet. And all of them are I/O operation. So basically, if you want to, uh, you know, allocate one thread for each download operation, uh, you will not probably able to uh, download 10k at once. It will take some time because you don't have a lot of threads. You will probably create a pool, and uh, let's say your pool has you know, thousands or hundred, you know, thread. So it will it will batch basically. It will first download first hundred, and then it will go for next hundred. Uh, and while it's downloading, it's basically staying idle because you know getting response from the third party, it's just wasting uh, a lot of CPU or you know a lot of idle time. Uh, but with the with the virtual set, you don't have to do all those things. You can just you know uh, you know just create a uh, for loop, and inside the for loop, you can you can just call this method, which is gonna download uh, responsible for downloading the MS, and they hand over this to a virtual set. And when virtual set start executing, and it will see an I/O operation, it will just yield itself, and your you know fork joint post set will again free, and it will take the next one immediately. So keep on doing that. Um, uh, one benefit of having this way is you, your code is basically imperative. You can see what you are doing while it's easy to read, and you don't uh, uh, have to you know go for the, some other way, which is. Uh, uh, um, you know, reactive program, that's the upper one, which is use um, some sort of uh, reactor, project reactor, all those things. So, so these are the benefits, basically. First of all, you can create a lot of them. It's cheap, and you are not wasting your uh, uh, threads. Uh, I mean, your CPU, there is no idle time. You are utilizing your resources, so there is a lot of benefits. You can create um, your uh, code again traditionally, imperatively, it's easier to read, uh, so less you know, overhead on your uh, head as well, so you don't have to uh, learn a lot of fancy things, 
and it's easier to explain your junior fellow junior developers. I mean, let's say you have a new onboarding and you have uh, written your entire application with asynchronous fashion, and you have to train him or train her. El <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it, it, it's gonna take a while. Uh, so yeah, for this one, you don't have to explain anything. It's just self-explanatory. It's, it's, it's a for loop. We are uh, calling a method and submitting to the, um, you know, um, uh, the, we're basically creating virtual set, that's it. And the, yeah, you can you can use debugger for this one. The first one you will not be able to do that. So, <laughs> so yeah, lots of benefits. I mean, I I definitely wanted to uh, go into a, a lot of other benefits as well. But since time is in the essence, uh, we are on top of the hour. I'll just uh, finish with this a quote: the person who actually responsible for this virtual thread, which is, oh, his name is Ron Fressler. If you just Google about him, Ron Fressler, you will see a lot of content. Uh, so you can just consume all, all of them. And he's one of the legendary code is this, which is virtual thread are cheap enough to have single thread per task and eliminate many of common issue with uh, writing concrete code in Java. So, so basically, you know, whenever you are gonna get a request, you just hand it over to a virtual thread. And a lot of frameworks like the Spring, Halidon, uh, Quarkus, and a few others are adopting virtual sets. Mm, and you'll, you'll see soon their, uh, uh, you know, their, uh, uh, probably they're waiting for 21, but they have started working already. And the other thing is, there aren't new many APIs you have to learn, but, you don't need to unlearn many of habits, such as using thread pool to deal with resource contention. So you don't have to <laughs> use thread pool anymore because you know thread pool is always a difficult thing, right? You have to tune, you have to find a perfect balance. You don't want to create too many uh, uh, thread and you don't want to create too less. So finding the sweet, pause, sweet spot is always difficult. Now that whole thing is eliminated, so you have some time, so and you can spend that time with your family and friends, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So that's all. And and final uh, thing, it's a plug. Sorry about that. Uh, basically, I, I I write a newsletter monthly. Um, if you want, uh, basically I share all those things, what I you know learn, read, uh, especially about virtual chat. If you want to you know get those monthly basis. You can just subscribe here. <laughs> so thank you. That's all I have. <laughs> <laughs>